Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning for those of you who are listening in from Japan or elsewhere in the world. Thank you for joining us today in the web webinar, The Power of the Games for Communities, which is part two of the Olympics series, Why Resilience Matters, How Adversity Molds Us. My name is Yuko Kaifu, and I'm the president of Japan House Los Angeles. It is a great honor and pleasure to co-host this great webinar with the Consulate General of Japan in Los Angeles and Japan America Society of Southern California. For those of you who are not familiar with who we are, Japan House is. Uh, Japan House is a public and cultural diplomacy initiative launched by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan to showcase various aspects of Japan. We're located in Hollywood um, with the gallery, the library, event hall, and spaces for the restaurant and, and retail um, spaces. Unfortunately, of course, under the pandemic, our facilities are closed at the moment, but we have been carrying out many webinars and online programs like this, that the one that we are co-hosting today. In the part one of this webinar series held last week entitled Facing Setbacks Like a Champion, we invited Olympic athletes from both the United States and Japan who shared their personal stories and experience as to how they overcame challenges and setbacks. In today's part two program, we will be joined by senior executives of, to of Tokyo 2020 and LA 28 organizing committees, Mr. Hidemasa Nakamura, Games Delivery Officer from Tokyo Organizing Committees of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, and Mr. John Harper, COO of LA28. Each speaker would make an approximately 15 minute presentation to update us on event planning and excitement leading up to the upcoming games. Later in our session, we'll be joined by Renata Simro, President and CEO of the LA84 Foundation who will be moderating their dialogues to explore how planners work together to create an amazing games experience for both athletes and fans. First, before we start the program, I'd like to ask Consul General of Japan, Akira Muto, to say a few words. Consul General? Yes, hi. Uh, thank you, Yuko, as well, as always. And thank you all for joining us today. Japan will host the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games in summer 2021. It is our hope but the games will be a global celebration and a symbol of how mankind defeated COVID-19 together. Japan's top priority is to ensure athlete safety at the games. With streamlining measures and COVID-19 countermeasures under consideration, I look forward to hearing about these topics from members of the organizing committees for the Olympic and Paralympics Games in Tokyo next summer and in Los Angeles in 2028, who have joined us for today's event. Thank you to Japan House, Los LA, and the uh, Japan America Society of Southern California for working with us to put us this together. Thank you to our guest speakers and to all for joining us. Please have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Consul General. It's always good to have you. It's very kind of uh, you uh, to be with us. Now I'd like to introduce Douglas Montgomery, the chair of the board of Japan America Society of Southern California, who is a great partner and friend as well. Doug? Hi, everybody. Um, as Kaipusan stated, I'm chair of Japan America Society of Southern California, an MPO operating here in Los Angeles, focused on creating meaningful relations between US and Japan. As stated by both President Kaipo and Consul General Muto, we are thrilled to be part of a webinar series that further strengthens the bridge between LA and Japan. This is something that we've been working on for 111 years, the oldest um, relationship between US and LA in, in town, and we're very proud of this. JSSC were great supporters in 1932 and 1984 for the LA Olympics and 1964 in Tokyo. Our members are excited to continue this tradition with Tokyo 2020 and LA 28. Why resilience matters, how adversity molds us from the point of view of organizers is dear to our hearts as organizers ourselves. Um, JSSC pivoted this year to uh, a series of webinars, which included um, this one on the Olympics, our women's leadership counts, annual conference, lighter focused events like our happy hour hot breaks, maybe even a film festival. We hope to learn from the, 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 the big guys um, on how to you know, put on uh, larger events. And we are gonna sit back now 
take some notes and I will pass it back to President Kaifer. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. It's indeed an exciting and I also would be taking notes. Uh, we're all excited to, uh, to see the, the start of the program. But before we do that, I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements. Please direct your attention to the screen, which has a list of guidelines. Everyone except for the speakers are muted and videos turned off. The audience chat function is disabled. You can submit questions anytime during the program by using the um, function bar, uh, Q&A function bar. Please send your questions in English. You may also want to note whom you want to direct your questions to. This webinar is being recorded and we're planning to post it on our websites later. So without further ado, I'd like to call upon the first speaker, Mr. Hidemasa Nakamura, CDO, which is Games Delivery Officer and Executive Director of Sports of the Tokyo Organizing Committee of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Mr. Nakamura was born in Switzerland and spent his childhood in Thailand and the United States. After graduating from the Faculty of Law at the University of Tokyo in 1991, he joined the Ministry of Finance. After studying at Harvard University Kennedy School, he worked at the Embassy of Japan in the United States and OECD in France. From May 2014, he moved to the Tokyo 2020 Organizing Committee. And in June 2018, delivery officer uh, and uh, sports director who, who oversees the organization of the organizing committee responsible for preparing the tournament. Hide Nakamura, Nakamura-san, thank you. Hello. Thank you very much, Kaif-san. Hello, everybody. This is Hide Nakamura. I'm a, a Games Delivery Officer of Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Yes, uh, as uh, Kaif-san explained, good news, I had the uh, three times staying in the United States. It's a good news. But the uh, bad news, stayed in New York in my elementary school days and stayed in Boston in the graduate school and uh, working for the Washington, D.C. as Office of a uh, uh, Japanese Embassy. So uh, all three times it's in the uh, East Coast. That is the bad news. But just two years ago, I visited the, uh, Los Angeles and visited the uh, uh, new office of LA 28, mm -hmm. exchanged the uh, uh, knowledge and the view with LA 28 and IOC and the uh, London uh, Committee and Rio Committee. That is a wonderful experience in the also uh, that was the, uh, my backbone of the uh, Olympic and Paralympic population. So uh, today I'm very honored to uh, come back to Los Angeles and share the views and information with the uh, participants today. So uh, may, may I start my presentation? The first, as you might know, this end of March, we decided with the uh, IOC and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, Japanese government about post format of Olympic and Paralympic Games. That is the first uh, event of the uh, Olympic and Paralympic history. I myself and also most of our staffs in the uh, organizing committee lost in a way. But just after the post format, we discussed internally about how to restart operational movement to next summer uh, in 2021. So uh, first, I would like to what we thought in the April, just after the one month after the uh, decision postponement. This is what we thought about Olympic and Paralympic Games before the COVID-19. The key concept is the same, the sports and the power of sports, peace, coexistence, uh, etc. We recognize the Olympic and Paralympic is the, uh, the one of the world's largest sports event. From the point of view of quantity, the largest number of athletes, stakeholders, tasks, volunteers, spectators, et cetera, et cetera. And also uh, from a uh, point of quality, we seek for the high level, highest level uh, service standard. Sometimes we face the criticism for the uh, high cost, but basically we aim to raise the excitement for the largest and best event of the world. It was generally accepted. The COVID-19 is changed everything. As I explained, this is the first ever games postponement in the Olympic and Paralympic history. Serious impact on the uh, financial side. Not only our committee's uh, finance, it brings about the uh, additional huge cost. But furthermore, to Tokyo and to uh, the Japan and to the all of the world, 
we had economical severe impact, um, employment, bankruptcy, etc. And the, uh, yes, uh, uh, also the budget deficit pressure. And also, not only finance and economic, but also uh, society, all of the society, it had severe impact. Uh, there are a lot of death, illness, poverty that was caused by uh, COVID-19. So we, we recognize excessive celebration are not expected and uh, uh, rather rejected. So uh, we have to, we need to change the operational drastically to avoid the crowding as much as possible. But on the other hand, we also recognize that there is a hope. Everybody uh, seek for the uh, some uh, big event that is the highlight, the overcome the uh, COVID-19 situation. So uh, uh, considering such change of circumstances, first we decided to reduce the ad additional cost as much as possible. But not only uh, financial reduction, we also seek for the uh, simple gain. As for the quantity, we are seeking for the reducing number of the stakeholders, staffs, and volunteers. Also, we try to consider about the athletes, but discuss with the uh, IOC and IPC. We keep the uh, number of athletes, but on the other hand, uh, stakeholders, staffs, volunteers, spectators might be reduced. And service level, we will streaming streamline as as much as possible. As for the area, uh, we will go back to the competition itself, the uh, core of the Olympic and Paralympics, such as side events regarding uh, cultural or other events will be uh, devised. And also, as I explained, we we uh, set Olympic and Paralympic Games in Tokyo as a human hope. Everybody understand the importance of health and the uh, lives. We recognize again about the uh, importance of the uh, playing sports and also uh, recognizing the power of athlete. So we recognize about the origin of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, the nobility of the life and cooperation and sports. That is the basis of the people's hope. And so we will make it simple, uh, the games. And also, the simple game is the important in securing and security safety of the games. That is what we thought internally in the end of April. And after that, we start the preparation of the games since then. And uh, let me uh, go back to our game vision. Our game's vision as following. The sports has the power to change the world and our future. The Tokyo 1964 Games completely transformed Japan and Tokyo. Next, Tokyo 2020 Games, as the most innovative in history, will bring positive reform the world by building on three core concepts. Three pillars is the, the first, the striving for your personal best. Second pillar, accepting one another, unity in diversity. And third pillar, passing on legacy for the future connecting tomorrow. As for the uh, third pillars, passing on legacy for the future. As for the uh, 1964 games, iconic symbol was the uh, motorways, Shinkansen, bullet train, and the uh, highway, and a lot of high-rise building. That is foundation of the Japanese economic growth. But more than 50 years have passed since last game, we are seeking for what change will Japan be able to contribute to the world this time? Uh, in this respect, we said uh, one major legacy of 2020 games is the uh, sustainability. As you see in this picture, we said the five pillars, climate changes, resource management, natural environment and biodiversity, the human rights, labor and fair business practices, and finally, involvement, cooperation, and communication. As for the climate change, we're seeking for a lot of CO2 reduction, a carbon footprint of the Tokyo 2020 games. And also we are seeking for the 100% renewable energy use through the various initiative. And some are renew renewable energies coming from Fukushima to Tokyo. And the third, the hydrogen energy use to create a hydrogen-based economy. With uh, cooperation with the Tokyo Metropolitan Government and Japanese government, we will use the hydrogen energy in the uh, Olympic and Paralympic village. 
including hydrogen carriage mobile uh, items. We also put stress on the uh, importance of diversity and inclusions. We have made key phrase as no differences, show differences. I must think it's a, not so a new, not so unique for the uh, Los Angeles people, but as you might know, the Japan is more a uh, conservative society. So uh, we think it's a good chance for us to change the uh, cultural <clears throat> situation to using the opportunity of the uh, Tokyo 2020 Games. Here's the uh, uh, four pillars of the, our major point of the diversity and inclusion. For the uh, point of sustainability, we proceed the uh, Tokyo 2020 medal project. We have to produce the, uh, more than the uh, 5,000 medals for the games. And uh, we need a lot of gold and silver and bronze. And we decided we will make those uh, more than 5,000 medals, gold and silver and bronze uh, from recycled, recycled metal extracted from the used mobile phones and other consumer electronics. Some games has tried such a, a same uh, action, but it's just the uh, part of medals. We succeed to 100% medals is uh, made from the recycled process. That is a good the, uh, milestone the, on the way to making the sustainable society. As for the uh, preparation for the games, two major pillars we have. One is simplification and one is the COVID uh, countermeasures for COVID-19. As for simplification, worked with the IOC, IPC, and the uh, stakeholders since last June. Uh, we focused on the uh, 52 items through the all aspects of the games. We made more than 30 billion yen cost reduction. The emphasis on the uh, aim of uh, simplification. Yes, cutting the cost is the uh, one major object of the simplification. But again, as the whole world is in a COVID-19 crisis and society and economy have changed dramatically, we think Olympic and Paralympic Games need to be transformed in line with this situation. Next year's game will be simple, safe, and secure through simplification and COVID-19 countermeasures. This is what society is seeking for. And the, uh, this transformation in the Olympic Paralympic Games will be a big message to society and provide the new standards. It's the uh, COVID-19 countermeasures process. We made the uh, three-party council in this September. It's the uh, form of the uh, uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government as the uh, host city, national Japanese government as the uh, host country, and Tokyo 2020. Before the COVID-19, frankly speaking, those three parties had the uh, internal battle for the uh, sharing the responsibility and sharing the uh, financial uh, responsibility. It's a very tough uh, negotiation. But the, uh, once COVID-19 situation has occurred, those three parties cooperate very strongly. We made this council. We had two meetings every month. After every meeting, we uh, published the uh, output of the meeting of the uh, uh, countermeasure of COVID-19 and the uh, uh, media interim report beginning of this month. Big uh, picture of the uh, countermeasure of the COVID-19 is the, in the next slide. As you know, we need a total package. No one big uh, uh, measure cannot solve full situation. So uh, from arrival in Japan and to the departure from Japan, transportation, host town, competition venue, Olympic Paralympic Village, training venues. We will uh, make the uh, full package to secure the uh, athlete. And also we are keeping safety of the uh, uh, spectators, not from the domestically, but also uh, comes from overseas. This time uh, it might be uh, two details. I'm not uh, digging into the details, but the uh, next slide please. We put the uh, uh, three phases from now on. So uh, by the end of this month, we will make preparation of the guideline version one based on the interim report of the uh, three parties meeting. And after that, from January to March, we will revise with guideline version one with the stakeholders, IOC, IPC, 
uh, international federation and national Olympic committees, including uh, AOC. And we will have a test event from April. So before that, we finalized guideline version two. Testing at the uh, testing event, we will finalize version three. And with the uh, finalized version three guideline, we will dive into the uh, real games from this uh, July 23rd. Uh, that is my uh, uh, outline of experience so far and our action from now on to the games. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nakamura-san, so much. Um, it's a very rare occasion for us living in the United States to know the updates about how the preparation is getting progressing and um, uh, not only about the competition, but also about the concept and themes and everything else. So thank you so much. We invite you back onto the screen later for the, the discussion. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. John Hopper, Chief Operating Officer of LA28. Mr. Hopper is a business executive with a proven record of launching new ventures and managing complex projects from start to finish. In his current role, uh, John oversees the games delivery plan and the organizing committee's internal operations, including the development and execution of the commitment's short-term, committee's short-term and long-term strategic planning. John joined the team in June 2014 as a founding member of the BID committee. So without further ado, John, uh, the mic is yours. Thank you, President Keifu and, and Doug and Council General. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you in the Japan American Society today. And Nakamura-san, it's an honor to be speaking with you today. Uh, we're in awe of everything you are doing to adjust uh, to your environment and bring the games to life next summer. Uh, we look forward to observing and learning from all of your amazing work you know, in the coming months. I will uh, share my screen. Well, listen, I've had um, the good fortune um, of being a part of this journey in LA uh, since our initial bid work back in 2014, shortly after Tokyo was awarded their games. Uh, we were originally bidding for the 24 games and through that journey together with Paris, uh, we were part of a tripartite agreement uh, that awarded Paris the 24 games and LA the 28 games. And today, you know, we have evolved into an organizing committee earlier than ever before in the, in the traditional sense. Um, LA 28 is the nonprofit private organization for delivering the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games uh, in Los Angeles. And we're excited uh, to be able to show the best of our city and our people. Uh, and it is of, of note that uh, while we have hosted the games uh, before, it will be the first time LA will be hosting the Paralympic Games. We look forward to representing LA and, and leveraging the strength of our diversity and creativity and really co-creating the games to ensure that the best plans come to life uh, and the status quo is challenged all along the way. Um, so real quickly, uh, I'll take a quick look back on LA's rich history with the games. LA, LA has and does play a role, a really big role in the history of the Olympic movement. The Olympic games were returning to Los Angeles uh, in 2028 for the third time making LA the, the third city to host uh, three times other than London and, and now Paris. Uh, 2028 will be the first time the summer games will return to the US soil since 1996. Uh, in 1932, LA hosted uh, its first games in the midst of the Great Depression. 1932 introduced LA to the world uh, as a great American city. And then in 1984, LA hosted its second games, cementing LA as a great global city. And unique to, to those games, uh, 1984 saw a new Olympic sponsorship model uh, generating over $200 million of surplus, which helped establish the LA84 Foundation. And that foundation is, is the organization that Renata leads. And uh, it's served more than uh, 3 million young Angelinos since 1985, including the Williams sisters and Russell Westbrook, to name a few that have grown up through their program. Uh, and we really look to build on that legacy by investing $160 million in sports for kids throughout the Los Angeles community in advance of the games, and hopefully to be able to have a legacy for the games before the games even arrive. The 2028 games will use as much of the 84 model uh, that helped make it so successful using existing uh, premier facilities to reduce costs and risk, as Nakamura was talking about, uh, it's so important to 
the games uh, in this in this environment, uh, and including here uh, the Olympic Village uh, that will be at UCLA. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, it will be an opportunity to engage a new generation of fans uh, with the Olympic and the Paralympic movement. So our mission is to build an unparalleled experience for the world. Um, the games, as I think we'd all agree, unite the world. Nothing unites people uh, more than sports. Cheering for a common goal uh, gives people a sense of pride for their city, for their country, and, and for the world. More countries compete in the Olympics uh, than are in the United Nations. Uh, 206 countries will participate in the Olympics. Uh, over 180 uh, countries will participate in the Paralympics. And everyone participates under the same rules. And in 2028, uh, we look forward to welcoming in the, for the Olympics and the Paralympics about 15,000 uh, athletes to Los Angeles. As I mentioned before, we looked at LA as, as, a, as a different games. You know, we have premier stadiums and venues that exist today run by world-class operators already in place to host the games. So with in the Rose Bowl and the Coliseum, which are two of our larger venues, will be the first venues to appear, to, to appear in, in all three Olympic Games. So with a games plan designed to fit the community, uh, we can make LA all about a shared experience for the athletes and for the Angelinos. Our, our long time horizon uh, gives us a unique opportunity to explore unconventional ideas and solutions. It's a chance for LA 28 to set a new standard for what the Olympics and Paralympics can be. But we also don't wanna wait and have to wait eight years to have that impact. Uh, we have the chance to leave that legacy before the games even begin. So as I, I just mentioned, we, we are looking to make our city's youth a priority and in investing that $160 million into helping increase accessibility and participation in youth sports. So whether you're a future Olympian uh, or Paralympian, a casual player, sports gives a kids a safe and healthy way to connect so they can enjoy the physical, social, and emotion benefits that carry them through life. And certainly in this environment, that's even more important than it ever has been. Uh, we're committing to reduce the barrier to sport for kids um, so they have more access to play. But also in 2028, uh, Los Angeles will the first time, as I noted, host the Paralympic Games. And we really look at this as an opportunity to create and engage our community and embrace para-athletics and adaptive sport and create a lasting social impact and meaningful change. Uh, we look to inspire and engage the next generation of Olympic and Paralympic fans as we lead towards that 2028 uh, along that journey, as they will grow up over the next seven and a half years as we build towards 2028. But enough for me um, for a second, I, I may pause here and I wanna uh, share, share a video that gives a little bit more uh, visual aspect of the vision for our 2028 games. In September, we launched our, brand, our new brand emblem for LA 28 that honors creativity, diversity, self-expression and inclusion. It's built for the digital age. Uh, the emblem, as you can see, is animated, dynamic, and ever-evolving. The rotating A's showcase the infinite stories of individuals, Los Angeles, and the games. LA is what it is because of its people, not a landmark or a monument, and the emblem represent that, represents that. The emblem was inspired by the infinite possibilities Los Angeles and the games represent. As we look at it, there's not one LA. And the best way to capture our community's essence is through a collection of voices, athletes, artists, community members, who all represent Los Angeles sport and the vision for the LA 28 Olympic and Paralympic Games. So next up is one of our LA creators who developed one of the A's you saw in the games emblem. And I'll play a short video. My grandpa would hang out here in Little Tokyo before World War II, and then he came back after World War II from the internment camps. We were disenfranchised as a cultural group, so we formed basketball groups and sports groups, which really brought our community closer, which was why we continue having Japanese American leagues today. We're at the Terasaki Budokan, which is going to be a gym based in Little Tokyo. My dad fundraised 30 million to donate to the Budokan. This is really important to my family and my roots, and I hope that for the next generation, it's important to theirs as well. Part of who I am is getting people together, and what the Olympics does really well is get people together from around the world. 
when people see my A, I hope to show how tight our community is and how much we support each other. Kasaka is actively using the power of sport to bring kids back to their roots and celebrate his community in Little Tokyo. And this is just one of the many thousands of stories that the games will be able to tell the world on our journey to 2028. So to close out, LA 28 is thinking differently about how the games can serve its community, sport, and the world. We look at it as an opportunity to change the course of history, to positively impact the city and the movement, to bring the city of creativity, storytelling, possibility, and magic to life through the games, and to harness LA's optimism and youthful energy. We're proud to be that private organization operating independently like 84 and, and unlike others. And, and we're looking forward to creating a positive experience for athletes, fans, and partners along that journey to 2028. Thank you very much and I'll pass it back. Thank you, John, so much. Um, it's, I'm already getting excited about LA 28 and it's good to be able to uh, keep this excitement for the next eight years. So um, thank you, thank you, John. Thank you very um, much. Now uh, we would have a panel discussion with the two gentlemen um, and moderating the dialogue is Ms. Renata Simro, President and CEO of LA84 Foundation. LA84 Foundation was formed in 1985 and is a legacy of the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, um, Olympic Summer Games. The LA84 Foundation transforms lives through its investment in youth, sport programs, infrastructure, research, and education across Southern California. Ms. Semrel is um, an accomplished civic and private sector uh, trailblazer with more than 20 years of diversified experience with a commitment to leadership and, and service. So uh, welcome, Renata, and thank you, and, and uh, take it away. Yes, thank you, Yuko. Um, please, John. Um, Hide, please join us. Um, thank you. Hello. First, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Japan House of Los Angeles, Council General of Japan in Los Angeles, and the Japan American Society of Southern California, and certainly our two distinguished guests, uh, guests uh, John Harper and Hide Nakamura-san. You know, I'm really looking forward to this uh, conversation over the next 25 minutes. Um, and certainly, you've both laid out uh, what the Olympics means um, as it provides our global community with a spectacular uh, platform, I should say, uh, to revel in each other's triumphs, uh, admire strength and defeat, and unite in a co in common passion, often at times when it's sorely needed. And certainly, uh, we know that the Olympics is sorely needed to get us through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but it also reminds us that sports are often more than just fun and games. They are part of our local, our national, and our global identity. And certainly as an avid sports fan um, and a fan of the Olympics in particular, um, I've witnessed firsthand the ability of sports to inspire pride and to unite people within communities across countries and even on a global scale. So Nakamoto-san, let me start with you. You certainly gave a very detailed and insightful overview of the state of Japan in the 2020 Olympics. Um, but can you share with us what these games mean to the Japan community and what you're most excited about? Uh, is the question for me? Yes. What do the ah, Japan okay. Games mean? What do the Olympics in 2020 mean uh, to the Japan community? And what are you most excited about? The message has uh, slightly changed after the COVID-19. One example, uh, before COVID-19, the one of the uh, message of uh, reconstruction from earthquake in Fukushima. We will, using the uh, Olympic Games, Olympic and Paralympic Games, uh, we will say uh, thanks to the uh, world about the recovering from the diver, uh, disaster, and the also a message for the uh, resilience against earthquake. But yes, I understand LA has the experience of the earthquake, but uh, most of the world has not experienced the earthquake. But COVID-19 is the same. It's how to react and coexist with natural environment. Using next Olympic, I'm very excited to show the uh, world, not the uh, power of sports or power of athlete and peace, but also it is important to coexist with nature and biting each other is very uh, important. I think it's a good chance for such a kind of message to pass all over the world. Yes, no, thank you. That's certainly an important message um, when we talk about mm -hmm. climate change and global warming. So thank you for that. Um, John, you know, certainly you have a longer one, runway with LA28, um, and I just want to make note of the significance that while the LA 
Los Angeles has hosted both the 32 and the 84 games. This is the first time that we'll be hosting the Paralympic Games at the same time. What's the significance of that, not just to Los Angeles, but to the world? No, thank you, Renata. No, and I, as I said you know, earlier in, in the presentation, I think it's, um, it's extremely significant to have the opportunity to amplify the notion of Paralympic and adaptive sport for the community, not only of LA, but for the United States. And I think it's, it's an opportunity that will be able to demonstrate sport uh, in an inclusive environment, in a truly inclusive environment in LA that has never been done before because it, it was not um, here for the 84 or the 32 games. So we're very much mm -hmm. bringing um, our um, you know, co-creation and way of thinking to, to putting on both the Olympic and Paralympic games uh, and bringing those to life uh, in 2028 together. Yeah, no, sorry. And, and for Nakamoto-san, for you in hosting mm -hmm. the Paralympic Games, what is the significance um, of that? And to both of you, how has hosting the Paralympic Games at the same time of the Olympic Games, does that have any um, uh, impact on the facilities, the transport? How are you adjusting to um, the accommodations required um, in that case? Um, Mr. Nakamoto-san, to you first, and then John, maybe you can follow on that question. Uh, thank you, Leta san Yes, the, uh, that is also an important point. Paralympic is the uh, good chance for us to Tokyo to fit uh, with disabled person uh, of transportation accommodation, as you mentioned. But I think uh, not only hard infra infrastructure, but also a soft human compassion with the uh, Paralympics is also important. As myself, before joining the uh, Olympic Paralympic Committee, I'm not much uh, experience and knowledge about the Paralympics. But after I worked for more than uh, six years, my my feeling and consideration for the Paralympics, Paralympics, Paralympics is cons uh, uh, completely changed. But I'm about a 50 years old person, so uh, maybe I'm not sure. My life uh, is 40 years, I'm 30 years, I'm not sure. But the, uh, the uh, John uh, mentioned about the kids. Kit is very important part. If Every kid in Tokyo metropolitan city or in Japan watching the Paralympic, they are very naive and they have feel a uh, strong impression from the Paralympics. And I mm -hmm. think their way of thought will be completely changed. If so, they grew up eight or uh, 10 years after, they will be uh, 20 years old. And the, maybe the most of people in Japan, in Tokyo, has the compassion with the Paralympics, I think the uh, Tokyo society and Japanese society completely changed. So uh, in that sense, uh, it's uh, very, very important to we invite the Paralympics in next summer. No, that's, a, that's an um, important point to underscore. It's using the mm -hmm. platform of storytelling and engaging the audience to really mm -hmm. drive mm -hmm. um, a change in their mindset um, in terms of yes. what's important mm -hmm. and bringing that inclusiveness to the forefront. Now, that's a very important um, point. Thank you for that. John, uh, how about you? What, what's your perspective in terms of does the uh, hosting the Paralympic Games change the logistics and the delivery of the game slightly? And if so, how? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Renata, and I, I think it's probably important to note um, for everybody that, and I think it's the same in, in Tokyo, that as an organizing committee, you know, we're one organization organizing both of those games. So it's not mm -hmm separate organization. It's not a separate vertical in our organization. You know, we're building the focus on the Paralympics as core to our DNA as the Olympics are, uh, as we start to, you know, put those plans in place. You know, as we talked, as I talked a little bit about it, you know, the facilities and foundation that we have here in Los Angeles on an everyday basis is spectacular and how those mm -hmm. operators and those facilities are already working towards making those to be able to deliver uh, not only for people with disabilities as spectators, but to be able to have the, the ability to put on a Paralympic Games. We plan to use the same games, uh, the facilities that we use for the Olympics will be used for the Paralympics for the relevant sports that we have. And I think we're looking to build on, to your point on infrastructure, um, you know, everything that LA is doing already today as it's evolving as a city uh, from their transportation infrastructure to be able to support uh, people with disabilities and be able to continue to amplify and build on that um, that behavior as we as we put on the games uh, in 2028. Well, thank you. That's uh, that's an important point to underscore. 
You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a question about uh, technology. Certainly, you know, I think uh, when Casey and the team was bidding on the Olympics, he often referred to in 2000, you know, the six, the iPhone had just come out and, you know, how that really changed the way we engage and communicate. And certainly COVID-19 has thrown us deeper into technology. Um, so maybe, John, starting with you and then um, Nakamoto-san, um, having you follow up, how has, um, how will technology and maybe let me ask um, Nakamoto-san you first, because I think technology may change again in five years, John, before the uh, the 28 games are here in Los Angeles. But Mr. Uh, Hide, uh, what is, how is technology changing the games or how are you using technology and innovation to bring the 2020 Olympics to Tokyo next year? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, before the COVID-19, one uh, of the, our major uh, point for the technology is the hydrogen. As I explained in my presentation, we will use hydrogen vehicle in the Olympic Village. And I think it's a good message for sustainable uh, society's message to the world. Also, after the COVID-19, human talk contact is very uh, dangerous. So uh, we using technology for the meeting and checking health condition and they are using the application, mobile phone to check testing results and health condition. So uh, it's very safe and the, uh, it, with, with paper, it is impossible to check each health condition, but it is easy to follow through the uh, uh, mobile application. In that respect, we will make use of the technology uh, to the countermeasure of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. mm. So John, we may have a whole new technology platform in LA-28 as fast as technology is changing. How is 28 um, thinking about technology and, and the use of it to not just deliver the game, but engage with the fans and connect with the athletes. Yeah, and, and you bring up a, a great point. I mean, just given the longer time period that we have, and, you know, to my point earlier of the fact that we're fortunate that we don't have anything to build, you know, we can focus our effort right now at the strategic phase on, on putting our resources, time to innovate around that game's experience. And, and I think technology will certainly be important to that. But what is unique is that the technology that we see today and the solutions we see today may or may not be what we need to have, uh, what we need to for uh, to be able to use for our games in the future. So what we're doing right now in that spirit of, of co-creation is as is we're looking to build our partnership program, both you know with our domestic partners, but also you know together with the IOC and, and a lot of the top partners that are in the technology space uh, to really be able to think differently about. Uh, how those solutions can be implemented in a way to, whether it's improve efficiencies in the games um, to help help make the economics better, to help make the operations more smooth, uh, but to, how do we actually engage with people differently leading up to and, and during the games and experience the games in different ways. It's hard to say exactly what that will be today, but I think that's really what's exciting about our journey. And, and we're really mm -hmm. looking forward kind of in the spirit of of learning and asking questions to seeing what happens in Tokyo and then ultimately in Paris uh, and along that way, you know, we'll be able to put some things in place to be able to, um, you know, continue to innovate, um, you know, past the 2020 and 21 and 2024. I know you, um, it's hard, you know, you're, you probably left your crystal ball at the, um, at the cleaners, but do you, do you think or envision that we could, you know, if I can't get a ticket to the opening ceremonies with VR, um, that I could actually be in, at home, but feel as if I'm in, um, SoFi Stadium mm -hmm. watching opening ceremonies? I think that's totally possible. And we haven't gone gone into the details of the technology but, uh, right now, but I think that is certainly on the radar and, and other unique ways to be experienced, not just the ceremonies, but, but all the games themselves. And I think we're also, you know, have the benefit, uh, again, with a little bit of longer time to uh, learning from all of the, you know, professional sports leagues, you know, here, here in the United States uh, and how they are evolving with the technology as well. And that kind of goes back to our, co-creation and working with the partners that exist today as they continue to evolve games presentation for their fans physically in the building uh, and, and watching from, from their, from their, uh, from their homes. Mm -hmm. and, and Nakamoto san, do you see the use of technology, virtual reality technology, as I just shared with John um, as, as uh, an element that will be included in the games in Japan next year? Yes, uh, we tried as, fast, as as much as possible. Yes, it's a part of the COVID-19 uh, situation. I'm not sure, but a uh, lot of people around the world can find a way to enjoy these sports, not only on-site, but also remote. 
So we would like to support this way by using technology. Mm -hmm. I'm shifting questions a little bit to the power that the Olympic movement and sports has to bring communities together. Certainly, um, I think it was Casey actually that coined this term, is that Los Angeles is the world in one city. Uh, it has the largest Japanese population outside of Japan, mm -hmm. the largest Chinese population out of China. We can go on and we can go on. Um, so Nakamoto-san, are there any um, plans to connect the Tokyo Games to the community within Japan to really build upon um, the richness um, of culture and diversity that we have here in Los Angeles? So if we're not able to get to Tokyo for the Olympic Games, how can the, the, not just the Japanese community, but the broad community in Los Angeles celebrate in those games mm -hmm. here at home? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, Olympic, I, I think the Olympic and Paralympic Games are very, very unique, unique event. That means, it's, yes, it's beyond country and races and genders, etc. But also, it's a good chance to make a strong bind among the uh, countries and uh, peoples. So I think if using the uh, politics, it is impossible to both to beyond the uh, countries, but also uh, bind inside the countries. But it's a strong point of sports that is not only emphasis on horizontal bondage beyond their countries, but also uh, make a good, strong uh, communication, not only inside Japan, uh, Japanese people, not only inside Japan, but also the Japanese people in all over the world, including Los Angeles. Yes, no, the richness mm. of the Japanese community here in Los Angeles mm. and across the globe is you know, quite uh, warming. What, what is it that you want? So J Japan is going to be on the global stage next year with the Olympic Games. What is, it that, what is it that you want the world to take away from, you know, what is, um, I don't want to say the best, but what is the richness of the Japanese culture do you want the world to take away when you're on the global stage next year, putting on one of the greatest sporting events um, of all time? Mm, uh, we are not so uh, diverse society as the LA and United States, but our omotenashi, uh, such a, a welcome feeling, I think, top level of the world. So, uh, I think it's a good way to show the uh, Japanese Oponenashi way to people all over the world. Yes. And following on that question, and John, to bring you in as well, and I'm, I'm going to shift to some audience questions and answers now with the time that we have left. So I apologize for looking off to the screen. Um, but how, do Tokyo, how does Tokyo 2020 and LA 28 collaborate with each other toward Tokyo 2020 and beyond? Um, will there be a presence for LA 28 um, in Tokyo? And then when the 28 games are here, will Tokyo have a presence here? How, how does that co collaboration or uh, coordination work, if, if at all? I'm happy to, to, to start. I think from, from LA's perspective, what we are most excited about is the opportunity to observe. Uh, and there is a, a formal observer mm -hmm. program that all of the games host. We will host it for future Olympic Games. And we're excited to take part in uh, the observer program where we can see all of the operational elements, the creative elements, the technology elements that went into uh, delivering the games. And I think that is what is most uh, exciting for us uh, as, uh, you know, in this environment and all of the countermeasures uh, that Nakamura-san has, has d discussed. While they may all be, you know, some of them may be uh, Tokyo specific, there's a lot of them I think that will be something that Paris and ourselves and, and other games can learn from. Mm -hmm. and that, that we will then be able to mold into our journey to 2028. Nakamoto-san, did you want to add to that? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I myself uh, learn a lot of from the uh, LA 84. Knowing the uh, past games experience is good movement of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. So I'm very happy to tell about our success, not only success, but also uh, our failure. I think I, uh, there is a lot of failure in next summer. But I will uh, tell Ed John about the uh, details of the failure. And I believe failure is the mother of success. Mm, yes. In staying with you, Nakamoto-san, this question is for you specifically is 2020 Tokyo Olympics, will the athletes, staff, and volunteers be required to take a COVID-19 vac vaccine? And will the spectators also be required to take a vaccine? Mm -hmm. Ah, good question. At this moment, vaccine is not tested and not injected in Japan. So uh, at that point, our preparation is to make a safe environment without vaccine. 
But if the uh, vaccine uh, proved to be a very uh, good way to COVID-19 situation, we will make use of it. But anyway, at this moment, it's uh, not mandate. Yes, okay. And we but that can change. Mm. And that as, mm. as the uh, protocols for COVID-19 evolve and change, you'll be nimble in being able to adjust to whatever the requirements are, I would, I would suspect. Yeah, thank you very much. But at least, uh, again, we will make use of vaccine if possible. But I, I think it's a, not a mandate process. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, John, this question is for you specifically, and it was interesting because it was a, a related to a question that um, I was going to ask. Um, you know, many people don't realize that the L84 Games wasn't just a financial transformation for the Games, um, but it, other, it also inspired many cultural impacts like uh, food introduced gastro diplomacy to the world. So this question is related to the richness of Los Angeles as being the center of arts, um, music, film, and other creative channels. How do you, um, with the 28 games, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking that far, how is LA 28 planning to um, really rethink, um, I don't want to call it the cultural um, Olympiad that was held in 94, but, but really blending those elements, certainly the logo treatment is one, a brand, a new brand for the 28 is one way in which you're doing that. But are there some other ways that you guys are thinking about bringing the richness of the Los Angeles culture to the world? Yeah, for, for certain. I think, as you mentioned, the, the way we, we approached um, setting our, our vision and our values uh, that came, came forth in, um, in our emblem uh, is really uh, emblematic, excuse me, of, of uh, mm -hmm of what the city uh, is all about. And I think you know, that is core to how we're going to be thinking about engaging uh, with the communities across all elements of the game. I think it starts certainly with our games plan. We haven't gone into detail of that plan, but for those of you that know LA, you know, the games plan uh, will have venues that will be in all parts of the community. So that'll allow us to, at, at, a, at a starting point, be able to engage with, with all areas of LA. And as we think about the non-games components of that, we're just starting to put, you know, in 2021 will be a year where we start to give some more thought to what the non-games elements, so the arts would be, you know, a component of that, the strategies will look like. But certainly, I would go back to the notion of co-creation, and it's something that we're going to really want to, you know, connect with the community partners in thinking through. Uh, but right now, um, you know, as we think about legacy and impact, you know, our focus has really been ensuring that, uh, we have the uh, foundational elements in place for the investment that we're making in new sports uh, as a starting point that will will you know be, be able to bring that accessibility and participation to life in the game in, in the time leading up to the games and other elements uh, like like areas around the arts will follow. Mm, very no, very good. Um, I think we have time for maybe one additional question, and this one's um, to you, uh, Nakamura-san. What changes or considerations are you having to make? specific to the opening or closing ceremonies to adapt to the new COVID-19 environment? Yes, it's uh, uh, on the way, on the way process. We are discussing with the IOC and IPC, for example, the Astrid Parade. As you know, the uh, very high density situation is occurred to the Astrid Parade in the games, but uh, we are discussing how to fit Astrid Parade to the uh, COVID-19 situation, etc. But anyway, it's a good message to the world how we overcome the COVID-19 situation. It's a very good uh, occasion. Yes, mm. no, thank you. Well, I, I certainly um, want to thank you, Hida Nakamura and John Harper, for um, joining with us in this dialogue this evening. I'm very much looking forward to the Games in Tokyo next year, and certainly as a third-generation Angelino looking to uh, welcoming the 28 Games back to Los Angeles in a few mm. years. Um, and so that, with that, I'll turn it back over to Yuko. Thank you so very much, Renata, John, and Nakamura-san for such an engaging conversation. We all know that the Paralymp uh, Olympics and Paralympic Games are about sports and athletes, but we learned much more that it goes far beyond that. So technology, innovation, um, messages for the younger generation, Passing on legacy for the uh, future, connecting to tomorrow. All these are wonderful concepts, and, and we're very much looking forward to seeing the Olympic and Paralympic Games next year. And hopefully by the summertime next year, uh, the COVID-19 will be become more or less a thing of the past so that many people from the United States and from the rest of the world can go visit there. 
Um, and certainly I hope that Renata and John would uh, be able to get there. <laughs> Um, yeah. And uh, Nakamura-san, we still have eight uh, years uh, until we hit uh, LA, 80, uh, LA 28. So please keep coming back. But uh, thank yeah, you so much. <laughs> we, thank, we, you we, much. We, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very happy. We'll have to it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank the viewers in the audience for watching. Um, I want you uh, to join us, uh, join me in uh, sending a big round of applause to the speakers. I know that you can't hear it, but you can feel it. <laughs> this program has been recorded and will be posted on our website um, on the later date. And the part one of the series um, has been posted on the website of Japan American Society of Southern California and Japan House Los Angeles. I hope you would enjoy seeing that the part one as well if you missed it. Please take a moment to fill out our uh, post webinar survey. Uh, once you leave the webinar, you'll be directed to the survey page. Your feedback is important and uh, help us keep presenting high quality programs in the areas of interest like the one that we have today. So thank you very much again, and I hope to see you again very soon.